Hi, my name is Sharon Chen, and I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician at Stanford University. In this video, I'll talk to you about enteric fever, which is a syndrome that starts in the gut, but is different than acute gastroenteritis. The learning objectives are to describe the clinical presentation, epidemiology, pathogenesis, complications, and treatment of enteric fever due to Salmonella enterica cerevar typhi. Explain why Salmonella typhi causes fever of unknown origin and not gastroenteritis. Explain the concept of asymptomatic carriage. And to discuss how the gastrointestinal tract serves as a portal of entry for other microbes that cause systemic disease. I'll describe to you how Salmonella typhi can persist for a long time in the very cells that are supposed to get rid of it and persist by evading the host immune response. Persisting inside the body but not in the intestinal lumen poses a problem for the microbe to get out, so I'll discuss some ideas of how Salmonella typhi exits. Here's a summary table for the clinical syndrome of enteric fever. The main cause of enteric fever is Salmonella typhi and Salmonella paratyphi. I'll focus the discussion on Salmonella typhi. Clinically, Salmonella paratyphi causes the same symptoms. The anatomic location for Salmonella typhi starts in the terminal ileum and colon, but then spreads systemically. So the main present presenting symptom is fever. The disease is called enteric fever because it starts in the gut, enteric, but it causes a systemic illness with fever. You will also hear this disease referred to as typhoid fever. The map on the slide shows the in incidence of enteric fever. The dark red are the countries with the highest incidence. You can see that this includes Sub-Saharan Africa, India, Southeast Asia, and Central Asia. Enteric fever is endemic in developing countries, so I typically see these infections in returning travelers. In a separate video, I talked about how Salmonella cerevars that are not Salmonella typhi cause diarrhea by invading cells in the terminal ileum and colon. Most of these infections are caused by animal-adapted Salmonella. Enteric fever is different. It is caused by a few cerevars of Salmonella that are human-specific, Salmonella typhi and paratyphi. Enteric fever can occasionally be caused by Salmonella cerevars that are not Salmonella typhi, or they're called non-typhi Salmonella, especially in immune-compromised hosts. Salmonella typhimurium in animal-adapted Salmonella is a new emerging strain causing enteric fever in Africa. Similar to non-typhi Salmonella, transmission is fecal-oral, but humans are the only reservoir for Salmonella typhi, so infection is from exposure to human stool. This is why enteric fever is not seen often in developed countries because of the availability of proper sewage systems and clean water. Enteric fever is a serious disease. It needs to be treated with antibiotics. The fatality rate is 20 to 30 percent if untreated, 1 percent with adequate treatment. Salmonella typhi has an incubation period of 7 to 10 days, which is longer compared to non-typhi salmonella. This infection is insidious. It starts slowly with low-grade fevers, and this may be the only symptom the person has. Slowly, the amplitude of the temperature increases, and the fevers can be associated with chills. Fever can last for several weeks and is persistent. Other signs and symptoms, like a large liver and spleen, abdominal pain, diarrhea, or even constipation, show up in the second week. About a third of patients might have an associated rash, called rose spots. On blood testing, you might find elevation of liver enzymes and low white blood cell counts and platelet counts because Salmonella typhi infects the liver and bone marrow. If you are suspecting enteric fever, the test you really need to get is a blood culture. Remember, enteric fever is a bacteremia, not an intestinal infection. You can get a stool culture, but the bacteria may not be in the stool. A negative stool culture does not exclude enteric fever. In the late stages of enteric fever, you can see delirium, called stupor. Severe complications can also happen. Intestinal perforation occurs from rupture of the pyrus patches. In the intraoperative photo on the slide, you can see the inflammatory patchy exudates and tears in the intestine of a patient from Nepal. Intestinal perforation and subsequent sepsis is what kills most patients. Infection can also spread to the brain, bone, joints, and heart. The pathogenesis of Salmonella typhi begins in the same way as non-typhi Salmonella infections, but they don't cause a lot of local inflammation in the gut, so they don't trigger colitis. You won't know you are infected during the incubation period. Similar to non-typhi Salmonella infections, Salmonella typhi invade through pyrus patches by injecting effectors via their type 3 secretion systems, causing the host cell to uptake bacteria. 
This is the salmonella splash, which you can see in the two pictures on the slide. Under the M cells are immune cells like macrophages and dendritic cells, which usually kill invading bacteria, but salmonella typhi survives within macrophages and dendritic cells. The electron microscopy image shows an infected M cell with bacteria inside it. Specifically, they hide inside the phagocytic vacuole, which they can modify with effectors that are injected by their second type 3 secretion system. Not only can salmonella typhi survive within macrophages and dendritic cells, they can also migrate throughout the body within these cells. The movie shows you macrophages moving around. They are very motile, and if infected, they can transport the microbe. So this is how salmonella typhi goes from the submucosal of the pyrus patches to other parts of the body. First, through the mesenteric lymph nodes, and from there to bone marrow and spleen. The spleen enlarges as a response to the infection. The photo shows a normal mouse spleen on the left and a spleen from an infected mouse on the right. The growth of salmonella at these sites is why patients can have an enlarged spleen, enlarged lymph nodes, and lab abnormalities <clears throat> that assess the bone marrow. Salmonella typhi also migrates to the liver, and you can potentially palpate the subsequent enlarged liver in your patient. The liver is the potential exit site because it is connected to the gallbladder through the biliary system. By infecting the epithelium of the gallbladder, salmonella typhi can then be shed with the bile into the gut lumen and then exit the host. The problem with salmonella typhi is that transmission occurs when people are not sick. When sick, the bacteria is in the blood and can't be as easily spread. After recovering, up to 10% of people can intermittently shed bacteria in stool for years. These people are long-term asymptomatic carriers. They are asymptomatic, but they can transmit the bacteria to other people who then can get symptomatic infection. It is a public health issue. The classic story is Typhoid Mary. Mary Mallon was her name. She was an Irish immigrant in the early 1900s who was a cook for rich families on Long Island. She infected many of her employers. Close to 50 people developed enteric fever. Three died, including two children. This was a very famous case because public health was just developing. They didn't really know what to do. They decided to quarantine her, basically jail her, on an island off of Manhattan for 23 years. Today, we have laws for food handlers. If they are infected with salmonella typhi, they must prove that their stools are negative before they can work again. Enteric fever is a systemic illness, so you need to treat it with antibiotics. This is why blood cultures are, are important, because you will want to confirm salmonella typhi infection and obtain a susceptibility report to determine which antibiotics should be used. We can prevent enteric fever with a proper sewage system and clean water. Remember, enteric fever is caused by exposure to human feces containing salmonella typhi. We can also partially prevent enteric fever with vaccines. Although I told you many ways that salmonella typhi evades the immune system to survive, the immune system isn't completely unresponsive. The host can develop an immune response to salmonella typhi antigens. Immune responses to a weakened strain of salmonella typhi and to the VI antigen, the capsular polysaccharide, are the mechanisms for the two existing vaccines. Neither of these vaccines have very good efficacy and immunity wanes. Other bacteria can also cause an infection that starts in the intestine but then spreads systemically. For example, brucella. You can get this infection from drinking unpasteurized milk. Similar to salmonella typhi, brucella infection can cause an enlarged liver and spleen and infect the bone marrow. Yersinia enterocolitica and Yersinia pseudotuberculosis are some more examples. These Yersinia infections are from exposure to pig products. They can cause a lot of abdominal pain, which can mimic appendicitis. One last example is listeria. It can cause acute infections with fever and diarrhea. It can also cause systemic disease like meningitis in newborn babies. The photo on the slide is an intestinal villi infected with the listeria in bright green. Each of these bacteria have their own unique pathogenic strategies to invade the gut and spread systemically.